I'm delighted uh, to welcome you to this fantastic um, venue uh, on behalf of the University of Nottingham's Institute for Policy and Engagement. My name is Stephen Meek. Uh, I'm the director of the Institute. The Institute uh, was created to help connect research from the University of Connecticut with um, policy makers and with the public. And I think this event um, I think we've certainly got policy makers, and I'm pretty sure we've got the public, and uh, all points in between here, um, so this is a perfect um, event um, for us. Um, we've got uh, a stellar uh, and substantial audience here, which is not surprising, so we've got uh, a great um, uh, event, and I'm sure it's going to be a fascinating presentation and discussion. I'm not going to say anything about um, the report, partly because I'm not really qualified um, to say anything about the report, but I did want to offer a few um, reflections on it. Um, the first is, and this is so typical of the work of the Resolution Foundation, is how it's an exemplar in how to present serious and often very complicated research and analysis in a really accessible and thorough way that doesn't compromise, doesn't dumb down, but tells the story. But that it's just a brilliant uh, narrative. It's a fantastic um, read. Um, second thing I to say is it's a word that kept coming out, kept striking me from the report, which is serious. You know, we're talking about serious challenges. We're talking about serious situation that the country's in, and it's a it's a situation that demands serious solutions. And I think it's perhaps a reflection on what often seems a level of triviality in the way uh, policy is discussed and considered at the moment, where you know one month's borrowing figures being slightly above or below what was expected is suddenly transformative, um, as if the issues that we're dealing with are issues that are 40 years or longer. Um, in the making. So I think, you know, all, all um, uh, praise for seriousness at the time when so often debate is trivial and debased. Um, but even though it's serious, it's not a council of despair. There's all sorts of solutions in them, but they're serious solutions. They're not quick fixes or fantasy economics. Um, third thing I want to say is how fantastic it is that this event is in Nottingham. Um, Nottingham features quite early on in the report, and it's for quite a grim reason. Nottingham has the lowest uh, per capita income uh, of any uh, authority in the United Kingdom. Uh, and that's pretty um, sort of grim statistic as an exemplar of the way this country is divided, the way wealth uh, is so unequally divided. And it's also, I think, significant that it's in Nottingham, and Mel will talk much more eloquently about this, I'm sure, but, you know, Nottingham has been, in effect, is sadly the poster child for a failure to think seriously about local government, local investment, and local finance by successive um, governments. Um, but also it's great that it's in Nottingham because Nottingham is such a fantastic city with such potential, so much going for it, and deserves so much better. And then finally, I just wanted to talk about the role of the university, uh, as you expected to in my role. So first, it's fantastic, you know, the university, Greg, uh, has been involved in the creation of the report. You know, universities as repository, repositories of insight and knowledge collaborating on important pieces of work like this is so um, important. But also, universities are part of the solution. You know, of the many sort of solutions, things that need to happen that are identified in this report, universities as sources of high level skills, as things that attract investment, that attract students, that attract people from overseas. Universities as sources of innovation. I mean, just picking a couple of the areas that are identified in the report, you know, the University of Nottingham are doing a huge amount of work on the green economy, and in particular around green aviation, likely to be one of the sort of manufacturing solutions of the future. But also the university and, you know, the work it's been doing, and I don't know whether John Gadigood or Marion Duggan are here, and they might be other people who are sitting on the list. Um, the work that they're doing on FinTech and the potential that Nottingham has to become a sort of FinTech centre, 
and thinking about you know, the UK as a service economy and being proud of that. So anyway, I'll stop rambling now. I could uh, drone on for hours uh, about the report in a very poorly informed way, um, but I'll hand over to Greg and I think that have a fantastic Thank you. Okay. Okay, so I'm going to be talking a bit about, um, about our report and next stagnation, um, kind of setting out the problems of economic stagnation in the UK, and that's kind of headlines of our strategy of, of what we can do about it. Please take a look at the back if you want to these out. It's just in 15 minutes of a, of a big, a big content strategy. So what's the problem? We used to have growth in this country, and ostensibly we don't have so much of it anymore. This shows 10-year um, growth rates in GDP per capita. Up to around 2008, we were fluctuating between sort of 20, 30 percent. After that, it has pretty much cratered. You might ask, why do we care about this? Well, you know, this is quite an abstract concept. <coughs> it's fashionable to say, whose GDP is this anyway? You know, we should all care about it. This is what's happened to wages over the same time. We're all basically getting paid a lot less um, than we would have done if growth has continued. So how much less? If growth would continue on the same traje trajectory as it had up until 2008, it would be 10,700 pounds per worker per year better off. I'm sure you're all agreeing when the cost of energy is up 1,000 pounds a year, when essentials are going up, that would have been very useful to have. But growth is the only problem that we have. We also have stubbornly high inequality in this country. We're the most unequal country in Europe. Inequality soared in the UK in the 80s and has pretty much plateaued since then. A lot of people think inequality is always going up and up and up. It isn't going up anymore. It's, it's just stayed at a high level and it's like not coming down. So why is this an issue? The issue is that low growth and inequality combined it's a toxic combination, specifically for households on the lowest and the low incomes. In this chart, we are comparing incomes with four countries, Germany, the Netherlands, France, Italy, where if you go on holiday to these countries, you might look around, they seem kind of similar to the UK, but it looks a bit, a bit like home. The secret is that they're actually a lot richer than we are. Um, unless, if you look all the way to the right, if, you have, if you're in the high, among the highest income people in the UK, you're roughly on a par with people in the Netherlands, people in Germany are slightly better off. Um, if you look at the middle, the middle of our income distribution, um, the middle in Germany are 20% better off. The middle in the Netherlands is 70% better off. These are big numbers. Right? Often in economics, we're talking about a couple of percent. So a whole, whole fifth of your income. Looking at the lowest, all the way to the left, looking at the lowest income people in this country, they're 27% better off in France and Germany, 37% better off in the Netherlands. This is a, a serious difference in the standards of greenness. So, what, what, what is our, our idea of the way out of this? We essentially we need a strategy. We don't need a list of policy things that we like, we need something that's coherent, we need something that's serious. <coughs> so three things. We need to get serious about growth. We need to be just as serious about reducing inequality. And to do that, we need to think about economic change as a way out of this. What do we mean by serious about growth? What's not serious is thinking there's a silver bullet, thinking we just need the right tax cut, or we just need the right policy, and then we'll get back on track, or thinking we need to get back to the past, where we all used to make things and go to work in factories, or we need to copy Germany and be a manufacturing powerhouse. It's not going to happen. What are we good at? We are a services superpower. We are the second biggest exporter of services in the world after the United States. And what stands out for the UK is, is, is the breadth of services that we are good at. So it's not just financial services, we're good at business services, education, culture, technology. These are the areas that, if we want to get out of stagnation, start growth again, kick, you know, kick start growth, these are the areas that we need to be in this moment. Looking at Nottinghamshire, the, the Nottinghamshire economy largely reflects the national picture of 
dominance by services, manufacturing construction is still very important. 84% of workers uh, in Nottingham work in some kind of service industry, which is the same as the national average um, in big sectors of health and education, uh, biosciences, uh, technology. So, <coughs> a strategy that focuses on investing in services is also going to bring up cities like Nottingham. Increasing productivity, increasing wages, um, making sure that any kind of strategy isn't just focused on, on London, it's focused on the whole country and cities like nothing. Talking about investment, there is no low investment way out of this. And that's exactly what we've been doing for 40 years. For the last 40 years, we have been the lowest investor in the G7. This is total investment, but anyway, any way you look at it, private investment, business investment, uh, with the middle layer. Average. And we can get away with a couple of years of low investment, we can't get to decades of low investment. Yes. This, is, this is what we need to request. We need to be investing in what we could have business services, education, culture, things that we have to compare to the rent. We also need to be just as serious about reducing inequality. Growth on its own will raise GDP, will raise generally raise living standards, but it will, it will increase in quality. People growth disproportionately goes to the people, the richest people in society. So if we want to share a growth, share our prosperity in this country, we need a, a strategy to reduce inequality as well. This is a two-point strategy. Work, a good work agenda, and making sure that we have a strong safety net. So what does a good work agenda look like? Looking at Nottingham again, because I think Nottingham illustrates the issue quite well. We have issues in Nottingham with both productivity and inequality. Um, the blue bars here represent um, productivity per job, per worker. Um, these are similar sized cities. You see Nottingham's quite low there, below the national average. And then the red bars here represent the um, income per person. And Nottingham again, well below the national average. So, investment in high value added service sectors is going to bring up the wire like that. But we need to be realistic and not everybody is going to be able to work, get a high paid, high value added. Not everybody is going to be working in minor sciences and things like that. So, we need policies and regulation that mean that there's good jobs available to everyone, they're well paid, they're secure. There has been a lot of progress. Over the last 10 years, almost all of the employment gains have come to the bottom of the income distribution. This is something that we need to build on and set to do this. Like, um, in the same way, uh, progress on the national living wage has uh, really made a, a good impact it's on a lot of day. But it's not just the amount of jobs and how much they're paid, jobs need to be secured. Around a third of the lowest paid, so that they are anxious about changes in their, um, changes in their working hours that they might expect. So we, we recommend a right to a contract reflecting the actual hours that people work, uh, requiring the employees to give at least two weeks advantage, advance notice of, of shift patterns, and increasing sick pay to 65% of people with actual owners and the shift on the lowest income. So yeah, this as well. And we have to understand that not everybody is, is ever going to get most of their income from, um, from the job market. It's always going to be a section of society that are being done by our benefits. So we need to make sure that for those people, they're not being left further behind. This chart shows the value of unemployment benefits relative to earnings, and how it's been falling steadily for, for around 50 years. We need to make sure that if we want to share prosperity, we need to make sure that working age benefits increase in line with earnings rather than the inflations that you know. Upgrading the state pension in exactly the same way was paid for around half of this. And we also need to remove the sharp perceptions of the benefit system. That means to try to limit the benefit cap and um, policies that are pretty much just pushing the, the, the lowest income part of the foundation to public cheap. We also need to make sure that any gains that we make, the living standards are not being wiped out by ever increasing housing costs. And 
to do that we need to build and that's not what we've been doing. Um, this shows cows in Spark per 1,000 inhabitants in, in lots of different countries. The three dots are 1990 red, 2010 in blue, and then 2020 in teal. If you look at France at the top, you can see the progress they've made from the blue to the teal, from 2010 to 2020. Italy took progress. All the way down to the UK, where the circle, we've made no progress. We haven't increased our housing stock um, for, the, for the amount of access that we have. And that's why houses, the housing costs are so high. So we need to build on a sufficient scale, especially in cities, especially when people work, when the goods jump are, when people say people afford to live, work. We need to build an adequate share of submarket housing so the lives of people can also afford the decent uh, accommodation. And we need to make sure that the benefit system properly covers housing costs. That means no more freezers, that means no more caps on the amount of housing support that people um, can essentially afford a decent standard of work. So I want to talk a bit about steering economic change as a way out of this. There's a lot of anxiety about economic change. A lot of people talk about jobs being lost to automation, thinking about AI, everything's different to how it was before. The reality is stagnation is what defines the current times. Um, since the end of the 80s, this chart is showing sectoral relocation of people moving jobs to different sectors. So it's, it's gradually been declining since the end of the 80s. I think this is just sectoral relocation, but if you also look at people moving jobs within sectors, that's been declining as well. Why do we care about this? Because moving jobs is how people secure a higher wage rate and wage growth. The bottom here is the median annual wage growth for all workers. And you can see how much bigger that is if people move jobs, and even bigger still if people move jobs and sectors and move jobs in regions. So the less this is happening, the less these bigger value providers are happening as well, and being stagnated. But there are trade-offs to these kind of strategies. I want to talk about that a little bit. These are very hard to read. This is not as sharp as it should be. It's a bit better. And what we're basically saying is that the bars on the right, the high productive sectors, need to grow. We can't grow everything, so we need to grow highest productivity sectors, that means financial services, um, information and communication, that one says that you can't see at all, um, manufacturing as well. But to do this, the size of the less productive sectors does need to shrink because we need to make capacity for the life. <coughs> Things like accommodation and food services, which is very unproductive. We spend more of our money relative to the rest of Europe on things like eating out, and it's cheaper relative to how much things cost uh, compared to other countries. A good jobs agenda that is going to raise the cost of low paid labour, which means it's going to raise the price of these industries that rely on, on low paid labour, which means the price of things like eating out would go up um, and it would also create capacity for these more high uh, productivity sectors. We're going to have to do less eating out also. <laughs> But I've been very gloomy, very, you know, very down about the UK economy, and I've told you you can't get down anymore. What's the price here if we can, if we can achieve the strategy and to achieve um, the aims that we have in it? We're looking here at uh, five countries that we typically think of the UK economy as being similar to, so Australia, Canada, France, Germany, and the Netherlands. We're not saying we want to be as rich as the Americans, we're not saying we want to be as equal as the Scandinavians, it's something unrealistic. But if we achieve growth to the level that we can match the income levels of these five countries, across the income spectrum in the UK, there would be an income boost of around 15%. That's great, but we think we can do better. Just looking at inequality, if we can reduce our inequality to the point where our income shares match these five countries, this is what it would look like, the bottom quintile of the income distribution would gain a little bit more, the middle quintile would gain a bit less, and the, the richest of course would lose a bit. That might improve things a little bit, but it's not a deal. If we do both things, if we get growth back on track, if we reduce inequality, so we're matching the income shares and the income levels of these five countries, this is what it looks like. The bottom quintile, more than 35%, that's rough. The, the middle quintile, around 
25% better off. And there's even a little boost for the richest. You might not think we care about your ability to foundation, but we do. Um, what does this look like in real terms? We've calculated it as an average of £8,300 per household per year. I'll leave you there to think about what you spend that time on. Thank you, Alex. I'm sure we'd all quite like um, eight grand. Uh, I can't give you that, I'm afraid. But what I can give you instead is Nora Senior, who's going to tell us um, her reflections on what she's just heard, and then also a little bit about the East Midlands Free Port and what that is. Thank you. And I'm not really sure if I'm worth um, £8,000, but um, we'll see by the end of the evening. Um, I am an adopted daughter of Nottingham. I've lived here for 25 years, so I make no apology for my accent if some of you still think that you know I um, uh, come from a bit further north than here. Um, a little bit about East Midlands uh, Freeport. Um, I don't know how much any of you know or don't know about East Midlands Freeport. In essence, um, the Freeport is here to act as a regional catalyst for um, international investment, for jobs and improving skills, for innovation and for accelerating the, the region's journey towards net zero. So the Freeport has three designated land sites, you'll be familiar with them. Um, one is uh, the, um, around East Midlands Airport, the other is Ratcliffe on Sword Power Station. Um, and one is um, uh, the south of to Toyota on the A50. In total, um, it comes to about over 600 hectares, which equates to about 1,500 football pitches. So we're talking vast space and vast scope. And the investors that come to those sites and will be attracted to those sites will be given a number of, of tax relief, such as um, five years relief from business rates, exemption and stamp duty, and three years relief on employer national insurance contribution on salary, salaries up to £25,000. So those incentives make our sites um, very attractive as a proposition for inward investors, but they have to be the right investors who are actively committed to the social purpose of the Freeport. And that's not just spin. Um, we will rigorously test this, and if they don't pass, then they won't get the tax relief, and they won't be based on the site out of the Freeport. So part of this process is also about ensuring that we don't displace businesses that are already here. Um, we want new investment, whether that's um, internationally or domestically. It isn't about shutting down one site and switching to the Freeport. This is genuinely about attracting new inward investment to this place in the country. So the investment in, the, in um, these inward investors coming to the site will also unlock our social remit. So we'll receive an uplift in the business rates that these sites generate from the Treasury. Um, in total, that will come to over £1 billion over the lifespan of the Freeport, which will reach about 25 years. And we'll use this to boost skills, innovation, infrastructure projects and fund community schemes to make lasting, meaningful and positive change for those living and working in the East Midlands. And it's important to say, I think, that it is a public-private sector venture. So we have six private sector organisations and our six um, public sector uh, local authorities on our board. So just coming to Alex's presentation um, around a new national economic strategy for Britain and, and part of this is around the ethos of the Freeport. So I think that we need to play the, to the strengths of a region if you want to look at economic growth. And so we need to recognise the strength of um, the East Midlands and the growth areas of the future. I think that we need to define generally um, what so what specialisms each UK region has and what they'll be known for and then make every attempt to make that a reality and, and, and grow. And the East Midlands has a fantastic story to tell. When we were uh, pulling together the strategic plan and looking at what kind of businesses we would attract to the Freeport area, we looked at the rich heritage of skills and knowledge that we already had within this region. That included advanced manufacturing, um, green hydrogen production through our universities, logistics, um, life sciences, medicine, food production, um, and we have um, uh, one of the, the best um, ring fences, if you like, of, of automotive and aviation sectors 
based um, within our uh, uh, within our, our East Midlands area. So we're already starting with a good base, but we do need to make more of it. And where Alex was talking about jobs, skills, and innovation, then I think that you know any strategy needs to ensure that our workforce. Um, can reflect the requirements of businesses now and in the future. So um, we have to appreciate, um, I mean, one of the, I was interested in what you were saying there about um, the roles that the East Midlands um, workforce were already in and represented in. But we have to realise that almost 10% of our workforce are in roles that are expected to cease um, as we transition away from carbon intensive industries. So that means we need to look at what are we going to put in place to replace them, hence looking at our advanced manufacturing and our green hydrogen opportunities. We have to also retain more highly qualified graduates in the East Midlands, and Nottingham, despite being um, home to two world-class universities, has the second lowest graduate retention of all UK cities that have red brick buildings and we need to stop that. So when we talk about, and Alex again is quite right, we are a services industry economy, but sometimes you have to have a catalyst for those services. So when we talk about bringing logistics and advanced manufacturing to the Freeport, we're not just looking about what those companies do, but also um, how they can export, how they can grow. So we need high quality people who can uh, speak languages, who can deliver legal services, um, who have financial capability. So there will be a wealth of both experience and skills that we will be looking for and will need to be kept within the region, which then plays to Alex's points about we need to build houses to make sure that we keep them in the region, that they grow their families within this region and we have a, um, a heritage of being able to deliver um, real careers with well-paid jobs to people in this area. Um, Alex also pointed out that um, the East Midlands has um, lower levels of government investment than any other area in, in the UK and I think that the new mayoral combined authority will be a great step forward here but um, you know, we need to be on a, a level playing field with the rest of the UK so great to see that the funding uh, which was diverted from HS2 will be allocated to the Midlands and the North. Um, however, thought needs to be given to how those economic levers are going to be deployed, um, how they're going to be integrated and how they're going to um, support existing transport networks. So the Freeport benefits from being at the, the real heart of the UK. You can get um, to about 90% of places within the UK within four hours from the East Midlands. So our transport and infrastructure networks are critically important so that people can move their goods around the UK and we can benefit from that. So large scale projects need to be supported by um, a government, but any strategy also needs to consider what other factors do we need for success, like people, skills, and infrastructure in a sustainable way, which moves the country particularly towards net zero. And just a quick um, a mention of, of jobs. Um, as I said, um, you know, there is a high proportion of jobs in the East Midlands which are going to be lost um, because they're already working in carbon intensive industries. So that means we need to upskill and reskill um, our existing workforces to be ready for the types of new industries that we can attract to the region. Um, we are looking at how we transition towards a green economy at the Freeport. Uh, we recently granted um, a £5.8 million um, grant to East Midlands Net Zero Innovation Centre, which will be delivered by the Universities of Nottingham and Loughborough. We're looking at um, how we can address the availability of electrical capacity for development and low carbon projects, particularly around the supply of hydrogen. Um, and we're seeking to champion decarbonisation of East Midlands Airport through um, a, a Green Future study, which we're doing. So those types of jobs will begin to address some of the social mobility areas that, um, that Alex referred to. And the role that East Midlands can play in that, with the addition of the East Midlands Combined Authority, then there is a great opportunity, I think, for the East Midlands to get back into its stride again and actually make a critical difference in terms of economic growth. So I'll leave it there. Thank you very much, Nora.
So colleagues, uh, should I just explain what a Chief Exec does? Mm -hmm. authority. So I'm the Principal Policy Advisor to 55 elected councillors. Uh, I also then provide visible leadership to 7,000 staff, providing hundreds of service lines to support uh, a major core city of this country. So, so, so that's my role. Uh, and I'm going to talk about the city in context, um, its economic makeup, the transition, uh, and some of the things that we're looking at in terms of moving forwards, and importantly, uh, in terms of um, what's been said about the levels of underinvestment, both public uh, in terms of East Midlands, but also in terms of our levels of productivity, uh, clearly our mayoral count, uh, combined county authority is part of the response to that. So I'll sort of touch on that as well. Uh, and just to say that if you live in Nottinghamshire, Derbyshire, Nottingham, or Derby, uh, I will be writing to you because I'm the returning officer that will be dealing with 1.6 million electors to uh, the mayor. So, um, in terms of um, our approach, uh, our city boasts a rich history of economic success fueled by globally recognised uh, brands such as Boots and Experian, uh, a, a vibrant cultural and heritage scene, a diverse population, two world leading universities, an excellent transport infrastructure and a sporting prowess, which all combines to enhance our national and global appeal. However, amidst our accomplishments, we must confront the challenge of fostering growth that reaches every corner of our communities, aligns with our values and true inclusivity. Uh, most of my working career has been in London and the South East. I relocated to Nottingham four years ago to take this job. I live in the Arboretum. Um, so I walk into work in the centre, uh, but many of you will know it's one of the most deprived parts of the city, so I see that every day in terms of that inequality that the city has. Over the years, Nottingham has transformed from a manufacturing hub to a service-based economy with over 85% of employment now concentrated in the service sectors, as Alex said. And traditional manufacturing has waned. But in its place, uh, we find opportunities at the forefront of emerging technologies, and industries such as create tech, esports, and life sciences. And I want to shed light on the success of this transition and the future potential of the service sector in our city. Uh, the strength of the sector is to be applauded, and there are great opportunities to capitalize on our world leading service activities within a globalized market. With big brands such as Experian and Capital One in the city, FinTech has emerged as an important sector for Nottingham and provides a significant competitive advantage for our city. On the theme of technology, the University of Nottingham's Castle Meadow campus, which has recently been uh, opened up, hosts the Digital Nottingham Initiative, which brings together academia and industry and communities on cutting edge digital research and data practice. Similar positive stories can be told for the life sciences sector, which remains a great asset for Nottingham, not least with the presence of BioCity, just around the corner, an award-winning incubator space that continues to nurture cutting-edge innovation within its tenant companies. Of course, we must continue to support the world-class big businesses that make a vital contribution to the city's economy today. We also need to look into the future identifying new industries with the potential to generate inclusive jobs and growth in the years ahead. The creative and digital industries have emerged as a key growth sector, currently employing 7% of Nottingham's workforce and demonstrating five times the gross value added growth in the average industry in the city since 2010. Nottingham has experienced some of the largest employment growth in the sector since 2015. And the creative and digital sectors have clearly thrived in the city, evident in the success of places like Slinton Market as a hub for creative activity and support structures like Confetti, our Institute of Creative Technologies. With their high skilled jobs and knowledge intensity, the creative and digital sectors have the power to shape our economic future and address socioeconomic challenges. However, a common theme to unleash their full potential we must address constraints such as the availability of appropriate premises and the need for affordable workspaces. 
quality, affordable space, along with flexible spaces for co-working and networking, are essential for this sector to grow. As with other industries, skills requirements are also critical. Competition for talent is now fought on a global scale. We are not just competing with London. Access to university talent in our city has proven to be powerful, uh, but as Laura has said, demand for skills still outstrips supply. Access to finance to support growth has also proven to be successful. The recent expansion of the Create Growth Program, funded by DCMS, enabled us to successfully bid for resources that will support growing companies in Nottingham and Nottinghamshire, helping them to secure innovation and growth funding via Innovate UK. But as we strive for economic success, further long-term investment in the sector will be required to realise the full potential of our region. As a city, we aim to utilise our strengths and opportunities to tackle the challenges we face, generating a successful economy that all parts of our society can engage with and benefit from. This inclusive and sustainable growth is what underpins our emerging economic plan for Nottingham. This is not a plan we own, we are curating it on behalf of Nottingham, our city. And I would encourage you to have a look at our website, read the plan and complete the online survey um, to give us some feedback on the proposals. Finally, I just want to touch on the um, uh, linking the economic plan to the response which is uh, a mayoral combined county authority. It is only two years uh, that the leaders of four councils got together uh, to agree uh, that we should go for it. Um, we're the only core city in the country without a combined authority and a devolved arrangement. And part of the challenge is we've got over 300 local authorities in this country. And like it or not, sometimes when government wants to move quickly uh, in terms of investment propositions, underspends it wants to deploy, they speak to the metro mayors. They don't speak to 300 odd uh, local authority leaders. So we need to be at the table. And that was the basis of the conversation between the political leaders in this part of uh, the East Midlands. And I was delighted, and hopefully some of you saw it this uh, week, uh, that the minister uh, signed the final bit of regulation, which now means we do have a, a, a combined county authority. Breakneck speed. To do that uh, within two years is, is, is truly impressive. So what will this do? Uh, well, it will mean that we get uh, at least 30 odd million pounds a year to invest and to leverage and to borrow against. Uh, which equates to over a billion pounds over 30 years, but already uh, government's talking to us about 1.5 billion pound transportation pot uh, that will be able to be deployed by the combined county authority. And there'll be lots more to come. Whenever you look at budgets and you see what's happening in the West Midlands, you see what's happening in Manchester, you understand that in terms of government having confidence in delivery and accountability structures, it allows them to pass and flow more investment through. And therefore, that's really important for us, uh, that we have a strong and credible person who can be representing these Midlands around that government table. Finally, uh, in conclusion, uh, Nottingham and the strong service sectors which thrive here are poised for success. Um, of course, there will be challenges, but we look, for, we look towards the establishment of the combined county authority in the upcoming mayor election and with a new economic plan focusing on partnership efforts to build on our collective strengths. And we have the potential to unite and shape a prosperous future for Nottingham, ensuring that the benefits of our economic growth are felt by all in our city. Thank you. Thank you, Mel. So I think um, some, th there's been some really important themes coming out of what we've heard so far, and let me just draw together three, which I think all three of the speakers so far have mentioned. And one is that um, while we have some strengths, we're, we're starting from behind in, um, in a number of important respects. And then the second one, and this is the good news, that if you're starting from behind, you have potential to catch up. And that means lots of growth for ordinary people. And then the third one is that while we don't have a, a magic wand, we do have choices. And it's these policy choices that I want us to talk about now. So I would love to hear your questions to the panel. Uh, CEO of the Mighty Creatives, 
We're a social enterprise based in Leicester, but working across these Midlands and in particular, we're very closely in Nottingham, Nottinghamshire the last few years, particularly with young people who are excluded from much of our kind of social and economic and cultural life. The very the kids who are really at the shitty end of the stagnation stick, you might say. Um, I've got two questions really, one for Alex, one for Mel. Um, Alex, from the point of view of a small SME so, you know, um, social enterprise, what can we do to help aid in that stagnation? Is it something we can do realistically and practically, <coughs> or are we just looking at the big players in this kind of solar system of policy makers and all those policy drivers, or is there something we can do at a ground level to help those young people end that stagnation? And my second question for Mel is, um, very involved with Creative Quarter many years ago through development standard markets and the uh, development, uh, digital industries development. And I'm sure we're all hugely mindful that whilst we know the power of the creative industries in the country and in Nottingham and the Shire, Nottingham City at the moment is about to cut all of its arts and cultural provision. There is a, there is a serious disconnect between what we're saying about the power of the creative industries and what's going on at kind of public level. Can you say something to give us some reassurance that that kind of cut isn't going to wreak the havoc it could do? Is that something that can be turned around to rec that recognises the power of the creative okay. industries in the kind of service industry and, and what we need Thank you. to end stagnation? Thank you. All right, so I'll ask Mel to come in first, if I may. And then I'm going to ask, in fact, I'm going to ask Nora um, if she has any views on either question. And then if there's something that Alex wants to say after that, then Alex can come in. So, Mel. Um, Thanks, Nick. Um, and we have a meeting at the Council House on Monday uh, to determine budget savings. Uh, I expect protesters in Old Market Square, uh, and it will be for our elected councillors to decide whether to vote for a budget or not. And as you correctly say, uh, there are some significant proposals to cut uh, grants in that budget. So that's a, uh, a matter for elected councillors on Monday. But let me just say something around the context of that. Um, I think it's well known um, that this city is a wonderful, vibrant, diverse place. It's also well known that our council has been tremendously innovative and done some wonderful things in the past. Uh, you've only got to look at the tram system, the public transport system, and some other things. But we've also made mistakes. And some of those mistakes have been costly. Uh, and the cost of those things, if I think about an energy company and if I think about some inappropriate stuff around a housing management uh, organisation, that's taken £90 million pounds out of the council's reserves, which has uh, reduced the financial resilience of the organisation. The other thing I would say, uh, in terms of the pressure that councils up and down the land are under, some of you may have noticed today that there was an announcement by government that 19 local authorities were re receiving something called exceptional financial support in order to be able to balance their budgets for next year. Now, when 19 out of broadly 150 what we call upper tier councils with social care responsibilities are having to get special support so they don't issue the so-called Section 114 notice, you know there is something not quite right in our system. So the point I'm making is um, that we're in a place where very tough and difficult decisions are having to be made. And I think part of the reflection when I sort of talked about the economic plan for Nottingham being a plan for Nottingham and not a plan for the council, I think there'll be something about how does the city come together to support its people and to support some of its key sectors in the event these proposals come through. So, so people will have their say on Monday, but there's a reality that we have to balance our books by law. Other bits of the public sector can run a deficit. Health can, we can't. So, so that's the context, me. Thank you, Mel. Nora. Um, just to answer your question about SMEs and what can you do on a practical basis. So when we're talking to inward investors, particularly um, from overseas, they don't just want to know about what is the land and the freeport going to do. They want to know what the infrastructure is round about. They want to know where they can, where their people can live, and they want to know what their people can do. 
So part of the, the whole narrative around the creative industries, whether it's theatre, whether it's uh, digital production, um, whether it's making costumes, um, acting, directing, they want to know um, that, that they're coming to somewhere which has um, a base of culture, um, a base of um, excitement and positivity. So I think that there's, you know, the job for your sector to do is look at how can you cohesively um, uh, bring that narrative together. And the other practical thing is around, um, I mentioned about the retained business rates that will be generated by the companies moving there. That invest, the money that is raised there, there will be, um, uh, part of our remit will be to look at how can we stimulate growth in jobs, particularly around SMEs and entrepreneurs. So there will perhaps be um, a, a route forward, not right now because the, the retained business rates are not flowing to that degree, but it is something that um, the, uh, the, the Freeport, which goes across Nottinghamshire, Derbyshire and Leicestershire, will look at how can we ignite some of that SME um, community that, um, that we need to grow business, and particularly around um, apprenticeships and becoming employers of their own. Thank you, Nora. Alex, anything you want to add? Um, yeah, just a little bit. Um, I think in terms of what you can do, a lot of it you probably already play quite a big role in, um, in helping. I think we, we mostly focus on government policy and stuff in, in the book, but um, there's a big focus on the need for education, skills, human capital, essentially, in the particular um, sectors that we're talking about and creative industries is a, is a big comparative advantage that we have in this country. And I think there is a bit of a, um, a bit of a favoring, a bit of a focus on STEM subjects and maths and science and, you know, and education around creative, um, creative industry type roles is not, is not maybe as strong as it should be in this country. So I think you may be filling a role of, of providing that education um, and kind of knowing that you're helping young people to go into jobs that could be very, very rewarding in the future is great. Could I just add to that? So I'm um, vice chair of University of Nottingham and also chair of the college. And I have to say that the jobs that we're going to have in the future, we are not necessarily going to be learning about in either our colleges or universities. So meta skills and being able to um, equip yourself with, with things like problem solving and communication are actually really important. And that's why, and I've worked in France and Germany, so I, their education system is very directed at, at growing those types of meta skills that actually we do need art and um, music and acting to be able to be taught to our children so that we develop those type of entrepreneurial and social skills that we have kind of neglected in our whole education system. So if there were anything that I would say about creative industries, it's about reigniting and including um, from, in a social inclusion manner, how can we get young people really interested in those things again? Because I can guarantee that employers of the future will be looking at those problem solving and communication skills that we currently are overlooking. Thank you, Nora. Uh, there's a question here. Okay, this is one um, from, um, from an economic kind of perspective on the modeling and thinking through stuff. We, we're in a, what we call a demographic transition on, we're seeing a shrinking population in terms of young people because it's changing, we're getting an older population with higher health care needs. So I don't know in your, in this um, plan, how are you taking that into account? Because we're talking a lot about young people, but we do know we're shrinking as a, a population, and this is across Europe. And there's this tricky conversation about how do we bring Workforce into different economies. So that's okay. Yeah, I, I can. I'll take that one. So that's a really important point. And uh, one of the things. Uh, so, so the question was about the aging population and what we do about that and what's contained in this plan. And um, you know, this is a problem we've seen coming from a, a long way off. Um, and there are lots of um, there's lots of political debate about immigration, and that may or may not be part of the 
solution, but, but one thing that is part of the solution is improving employment rates and hours worked amongst the people who are here. Um, what we, we actually did a pretty good job in the 2010s of uh, raising the employment rate amongst people of working age and then also people uh, older than traditional working age. And um, when you look at countries that are aging rapidly like Italy and Japan, for example, they've managed to offset a huge amount of their aging by getting more people, who, you know, more of the population into work. So the, the, if the problem is basically that there are uh, too many people kind of beyond working age, a part of the solution is to ensure that the people who are of working age um, are doing as much work um, as they want to and that they're equipped to do that work. Uh, and we put out a report on Monday showing that there's a problem, especially now amongst younger people with me uh, mental health issues. And it's now the case for the first time ever that you're more likely to be out of work with a mental health problem, with a, any health problem in your early 20s than you are in your early 40s. And I find that absolutely staggering. So it always used to be the case that the older you got, the sicker you got, but it doesn't look like that now. It looks like a kind of a swoosh. And actually, it's the young people's mental health is this huge problem that we've got. And, and this speaks um, exactly to the questioner because um, yes, the country's aging, but we're not actually using the resources of the working age population properly. So for me, that's a big part of the solution. But let me uh, see if Nora and, and Mel want to say anything about that. So, um, one of the interesting things, so my, um, my executive career was spent in a, a global company where we had um, 3,000 3, uh, workers um, in 120 offices worldwide. And what we found was that when we were under pressure from shareholders to make a profit, um, we kept our people that we, you know, as they were getting older and, and grew up the company, but they were the most expensive people. And it kind of, um, kept out younger people coming through and actually that was where all the talent lay. So we then looked at a model of um, how do we keep that corporate knowledge but how do we bring in um, how do we bring in new talent? And I do think that as industries and as businesses we do need to look at how we flex our working arrangements so that we keep our older people working longer um, so they kind of phase out into you know four days, three days, two days, one day, to free up the, the, the revenue and the, the money so that we can bring um, <coughs> younger people in at the at the, the junior end of, of their careers, if you like. And we have to balance that because too often what we find is um, that people retire and we suddenly have this paucity of knowledge that we were making our company successful. So I do think that there, we need to look at different models of working that keep people working for longer and engaged for longer because actually that I think has a lot to do with and we've, we've seen lots of um, reports on this about the impact of being in employment and the benefit that that has on mental health. Yeah, thanks. I'd probably come at it from a, a kind of public health and social care end of the lens, um, in the sense of, in terms of work is good for us, um, and we've got too many people in Nottingham that, whether it's through long-term health conditions, social isolation, or so on, are not participating in the labour market, and therefore contributing to economic activity. And so there's something for me about uh, how, through support that uh, can be provided to people in terms of, not just in terms of supporting them manage their conditions, but also connect them to communities, uh, reduce um, social isolation, and therefore uh, set up the conditions for them to participate um, in, in economic activity. And I think that's something that we need to kind of reflect on as well. Because in Nottingham, uh, the average age for somebody to start living with uh, life-limiting long-term conditions is 57. Can you believe that? Uh, it's one of the lowest in the country. Um, so it's a real challenge for us in terms of connecting people to employment. Thank, thank you, Mel. Question at the back there. Oh, yeah, thank you for the report. Um, Reg from Nottingham Civic Exchange at NTU. Um, we did a big piece of work around good work in Nottingham back in 2019, and um, it's really good to see good work kind of central to this piece of work thing. It's, it's critical to, to cities like Nottingham. We had numbers of conversations with the council and lots of partners about how good work could be a thing in the city and it's really positive a couple of weeks ago um, just over the road at ACAS um, we 
had to support a workshop about thinking about how the good work the charter across the Midlands as it is. Um, sitting on Midlands End the website is a skeleton, effectively. But it'd be really good to see how organisations like the Freeport could sign up to that and think about how businesses and organisations within the Freeport but across the region can sign up to be good work employers for the benefit both for those people's health and well-being, their voice in organisations, but also the pay benefits and the, the whole plethora of a kind of good work pledge and what that means for, for our, the place that we live and work. So just something we could see and promote and kind of sign up to would be really positive. Thank you. Is, is, that, is that something you just wanted to say or is there a question? No, it would be welcome thoughts on okay. the report about whether that's something, thinking about sure, the way you sure, talk okay. about how the responsibility of organisations signing up needs to be good. That's a really easy, positive message that you could pick up right now, I think. Let me ask uh, Nora to say something about that. And, then there's a and I've, I am absolutely delighted to say that we are already on the case on that, that we are drawing up a charter for um, a, a companies that are moving on to any of the tax sites to sign up to, and it's broadly themed around um, the Fair Work um, agenda. Uh, so, But we're delighted to talk to you more about that to make sure we shape it properly. A lady at the front. Thank you. My name is uh, Faith Kanje. I work with refugees in Nottingham and uh, when I'm looking at the way things are going in the city, there is a lot of destitution out there, refugees in housing, and uh, I'm not to understand tonight what is the plan because Nottingham has no integration policy, hence refugees are getting lost along the way and their stories are missing somewhere and their voice is not being heard. So what is the plan and where are we as refugees in the plan in terms of equality of services? And how long are we going to wait? And what is it that we can keep our hope holding to? That we want to know what the strategy is all about in terms of economic development. Thank you, Ma. Thank you very much. Uh, Mel, do you want to say something about that from a local perspective and then maybe I'll ask Nora and Alex to, to come in. Thank you for the question, Faye. Um, I think there's something about um, the significant deprivation and destitution that you sort of reference uh, in, in terms of parts of our city and the experiences of some of our people. Um, and there are some real challenges, aren't there, in terms of the availability of um, support, both in terms of accommodation and other support for uh, newer communities. I, I think a reflection I would make is that I'd want to understand in terms of the nature of the discussions that are happening at the One Nottingham Partnership, which effectively is our partnership that brings together a whole range of uh, statutory and voluntary bodies in terms of thinking about how we can be open in how we can be open and welcoming and supporting all our communities. So, so I'll be happy to have a conversation with you afterwards. Nora, Alex, do you want to say anything about that? Um, I'm not sure that I've really got much to add to that, other than all I would say is that um, from the retained business rates, then there will be opportunities to look at community projects, um, which will be of social value. <coughs> Um, but I'm not close enough to the issue to be able to give you a really definitive answer on that. I'd have to defer to Mel on that. Okay, uh, there's another question at the front here, <coughs> and then uh, that lady, and then I think we're done. Thanks very much. Uh, my name's Greg Marshall. I'm the deputy leader of Broxdale uh, Borough Council. Um, it's mainly for NOR, really. Uh, we've talked several times, the panel have talked several times about the importance of uh, infrastructure in the future of regeneration. And, Rockstone thinks that they can hold the key to much of that, whether that's large strategic housing developments identified in the local plan, the totem, whether that's logistics at Benelli identified within the local plan. But, but one of the biggest problems I think we face is the, the you know, devastating loss of HS2 at Totem, which I think could have been a bridge between, you know, high skilled manufacturing and engineering in Derby and high skilled academia and pharmaceuticals at Nottingham. The crumbs of that I think are still worth investing in, particularly the IRP station at Toton. But the funding model for that is a bizarre one. I'm outside of Houston, I can't see it. It's a part private, part public funding model for the IRP station. 
can you lend your weight, Nora, to try and shift that, that formula in conjunction with whoever is a successful mayor to shift that funding model so we can have a, you know, a fully funded infrastructure at that Toton site which will serve all of the East Midlands on that $900 yeah. dollars a border. Thank you. I mean, for me, um, the whole secret about, um, or secret, the whole route map to economic growth is all going to, is going to be about partnership. It's going to be about cohesion and it's going to be about ambition. So there are lots of discussions going on about various different initiatives um, and what the money from that would have been spent on HS2 would be spent on otherwise. There is going to be more funding on Junction 24, but we haven't quite given up on a spur on HS2. So um, that's all I can say at the moment. There are discussions going on at government level and we shall certainly lend our weight to the benefit of, of the area. Okay, we've got time for one more question then I'm going to let you loose on the free booze. Hi everyone, my name is Chi. I am an AI for Workplace Productivity Researcher at the University of Nottingham. So um, I have been listening to conversations about increasing productivity, more wages, growth and upskilling. So I just want to know how agreeable to human well-being and productivity through AI are policies and solutions. So the question is about AI and yeah, productivity. How agreeable to AI are your solutions? Okay. Okay. Um, do you want to say something about that, Alex? Or? Okay. Uh, so AI is, um, you know, this is something that's changing very rapidly. Um, I think the problem in the UK is not uh, too many new technologies, but that we don't adopt the technologies that we've got. So one of the things you notice when you look in the data. When you look at the report, and please do take a top copy on the way out, is that the gap between the best firms and the worst firms is a huge one in any industry. Um, and if we were able to uh, bring a, uh, either take the resources out of the worst firms and put them in the best ones, or bring the worst firms up to the same level as the best ones, then uh, that would make a huge difference to national productivity. So the first thing to say about any new technology is like, let's use the ones that we've already got effectively um, and that will make the economy massively more productive. On the specific case of AI, um, I think uh, the jury is, is, is still out. Some people are worried about existential risk from AI, that the robot's going to come and get us. Other people are worried that um, uh, people will be displaced from jobs. But you know, for 250 years at least, we've had new technologies being developed some people losing their jobs, and then the entirely new jobs being created. So many of the jobs that people do in this city didn't even exist 20 years ago or 50 years ago. So the key thing is for the economy to continue to innovate to generate new kinds of work as other kinds of work become obsolete. The second thing is there's a really nice paper by an American academic called David Altor, which I would recommend you to, it's very easy to read. Uh, he wrote recently about AI, and what he said was he sees a huge opportunity in AI in helping people access advanced skills. So at the moment, uh, if you need an architect or a doctor, you've got to pay someone a lot of money. Um, and if you're kind of in moderate, if you're like a moderately skilled person, you don't end up, uh, you, you, um, you suffer as a result of having to pay those high prices. And he, he sees AI as a way of democratizing human knowledge, actually, so that it becomes more accessible to people. And that might actually reduce rather than increase inequality. I don't know whether the panel want to say anything about AI or, or go for the free booze. Well, I think everyone would prefer free booze. <laughs> but I would just say that in terms of um, AI, so 98.8% of businesses in the UK are, are SMEs. Um, and SMEs are traditionally a, a sector, a, a size of company which are very reluctant to adopt technology and really embed it. But the reality is that AI is already here um, and it is used in many forms. Students use it to you know, run through their dissertations and make sure that you know, they, um, the uh, legal services use it to make sure that their um, spelling and grammar is correct. So it makes us more efficient. So I think that the, the aim is to be able to make sure that we can adopt in a practical way AI and let it grow with us rather than reel against it and think it's sitting outside the box because it's already here and it's already happening and we need to embrace it and make ourselves more efficient. I think on that ahead, um, it's a really interesting regulatory space in terms of 
AI and work and productivity, I think. It's obviously emerging very quickly, as Greg said, and um, it feels like it's going to be one of those things where nothing feels like it changes until everything changes all at once, maybe. Um, and I think with that comes a big challenge for, for government at all levels of um, you know, who owns that technology, what, what do we allow it to do, what do we not allow it to do. Um, so yeah, I think there's all kinds of challenges there, but obviously still emerging and still fresh. Okay, Alex, I'm going to stop it there. Thank you all very much indeed for coming. Please take a book. Thank you for your questions. Thank you for paying attention. And, and please follow the debate. Please follow us on Twitter, on social media. And if you don't want to take a physical copy, the, the PDFs are on the website. Thanks all very much for coming and thanks to the panel.